great occasion for us because our partner, Dr. Hart, uh, is such a great colleague. He's willing to jump in and run tonight's conference. And as always, he has some interesting things to talk about. And we thought about hardware failure um, and his great insights from his work in ISSG and materials testing, also clinical experience, which is vast, would be a very great uh, segue into the interesting case discussions, of which I think, Bob, we have five, right? Before we go into that, I want to recognize Bob. He's going to go on a um, family leave because uh, a member of his family is very ill. So this is a particularly cool thing of him to jump into the breach here. And we obviously wish him and his family all the best. He's going to take care of his family and do what we as surgeons also have to do, which is take care of our loved ones. Bob, thanks so much for jumping into the breach. And we're really looking forward to hearing your talk about material failures, roughly 20 minutes, and again, then five cases, and you're going to host it from here. So thanks, Bob, for doing this. And uh, welcome all to the Seattle Science Foundation Interesting Case Discussions. And uh, greetings to our friends in Texas. Jack, you're live. Yes, I am. I'm Great. Here. OK. All right. Super. Thank you. So Bob, take the podium and uh, let us know what you have uh, thought of in terms of material failures and how to avoid hardware failures. Well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, as Jens said, it is a little bit of a bittersweet occasion. Uh, but uh, it's uh, always a delight to be here among friends and colleagues. And uh, in some ways, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, distraction, I'll say. And uh, just to elaborate without diverging a lot of, divulging a lot of uh, personal information, my wife uh, is having surgery next week. And so I will be out of the office for a couple months taking care of her. And uh, so to have this in the last few days I'm here before being home doing that uh, is really uh, I could say it's a privilege. So with that, I guess we'll start with uh, start with uh, the presentation, uh, sort of a didactic presentation that concludes with a few cases also. And then we're going to have our fellows all present uh, one case. So uh, this is a talk I've given a number of times. How do I share my screen here? Sorry, my technical proficiency is always lacking. <laughs> Thankfully, we've got Ben here. OK. All right, there we are. So uh, you know, I think a lot of us uh, that do deformity work, uh, particularly in adults, have gone to uh, multi-rod constructs for um, many of our patients. And that's really going to be the, the fundamental basis of this talk. And we'll talk a little bit about different patterns for different types of pathology, different types of procedures. So these are my conflicts. Uh, I don't think any of them really um, apply to the content of this talk. Um, so all of us that do this work know that uh, rod fracture remains a significant uh, concern in the sense that it is not infrequent following long fusions for adult spinal deformity patients. And these are a bit, they're aging a bit now, but uh, the, these are several papers that came out uh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, the first three from in, uh, single center studies, but the last one from uh, ISSG data, and all within the same sort of uh, range, 10 to 20 percent, depending on the type of procedure. And what we found within ISSG was that PSOs in particular uh, were susceptible to non-union and hardware failure. Uh, some of the risk factors we all recognize, uh, obesity, of course, um, weighs, you know, uh, fatigues the rods faster uh, than uh, lack of obesity. Other comorbidities uh, that might block bone healing. Uh, infection clearly is an issue once that's occurred. Revision setting is another one where, again, the uh, uh, trabecular bone for a fusion bed is compromised potentially. Uh, I just went over three column osteotomy. Uh, I am a proponent of BMP for uh, adult deformity multi level fusions in particular. And again, I think the, uh, there's good data suggesting uh, or supporting the notion that that does increase fusion rate. And patients with osteoporosis, and it's, it's, I'd say it's no longer clear whether beast phosphonates really interfere with fusion, but certainly that's been a concern. Uh, previously and I think still ongoing. 
And uh, we also have to grapple with the surgical techniques we use and what do we use for uh, rods in terms of the diameter, in terms of the, uh, the metal alloy, and in terms of the number of rods we deploy. And that uh, it may be a, a solution increasing the uh, size, the stiffness, and the number of rods we use. Uh, we do know that construct length is not really statistically related to rod fracture. Uh, and what we mean by this, I think what this tells us is rod fracture occurs in the same locations typically for uh, thoracolumbo-pelvic fixation. Uh, and it does tend to be most prevalent in the mid to lower lumbar spine, uh, just adjacent to, I think, the pelvic, uh, pelvic fixation. The loading that occurs as a result of anchoring to the pelvis, uh, I think, is a big part of that. So if we stop in the lower thoracic spine or we go to the upper thoracic spine, it doesn't seem to make much difference. And again, I think that makes sense uh, because we really just rarely see non-unions in the thoracic levels. And if we do, it's typically maybe at the upper level of a construct and it doesn't result in a rod fracture, uh, it, although it may result in pain or, uh, or stenosis and need for revision surgery. We know the timing typically takes at least 12 months uh, and can uh, occur well after that. And I think, again, those of us that have been doing for a while uh, see, have seen this out past five years, and certainly I've seen that in my uh, practice. We did a study uh, with uh, Kojo Hamilton and Tamir Elon in the using the ISSG data uh, a, a number of years ago, and actually Alan Daniels was a fundamental part of this as well, uh, using the uh, well-known uh, fusion grade uh, out of uh, WashU uh, that is based on the. Um, uh, the radiographic evidence of bone uh, formation. Uh, and what we found was that that really didn't correlate that well uh, with the uh, outcomes, clinical outcomes, or the need for revision. Uh, but what does correlate much better is uh, evidence of uh, rod fracture and, and hardware, non hardware failure. Once that occurs, we know in most cases there's a non-union, and we know uh, that the quality of the clinical outcome is impacted. And not everyone with rod fracture ends up with a revision, but many do. And that certainly is a risk factor for revision. These are some of the data from that study, and I find them interesting. I'll show you why. This just shows that once rod fracture occurs on the, the two bars on the right, uh, those patients that don't end up undergoing revision surgery have slightly less than those on the far right that do end up uh, undergoing revision surgery. And both groups in comparison to patients without uh, rod fracture, but uh, you know, a low level uh, fusion grade uh, are less impacted. In other words, the outcomes are less impacted uh, by fusion grade than by hardware failure. Similarly for the SRS outcomes tool, and the one that I find the most interesting is the lumbar stiffness disability index, which we developed at OHSU a number of years ago uh, to try to sift through the impact that patients experience as a result of loss of motion as compared to pain uh, uh, is impacted. And in fact, those patients that have rod fracture, which of course increases mobility, uh, actually experience a sense of being stiffer. So there's a correlation, and we show, we've seen that in other uh, clinical settings as well. There's a correlation between pain and stiffness and really, when you're in a lot of pain, you don't access uh, mobility that you have available to you. And I think that's what this uh, supports. So the, the conclusions of the background uh, data are that plain radiographic measures of fusion have limited uh, utility in terms of judging true fusion and uh, clinical outcome. Rod fracture correlates much better uh, with outcome measures and often leads to revision surgery. Again, I said earlier, uh, not every patient with a rod fracture needs a revision. And in fact, not every patient with a rod fracture has a non-union. Uh, now, this is an example of a unilateral rod fracture, and this was written up uh, as a case report by Alan Daniels a number of years ago, and just shows this patient, if you look at his fusion grade, it is robust, and the other rod has uh, maintained its integrity, and the clinical outcome not impacted by the incidental finding of a rod fracture unilaterally. 
Uh, so tips and pearls for my own practice. Uh, I am a big believer in osteobiologics, as I've indicated. I think uh, most of us have uh, gone to some sort of preoperative assessment, particularly for elderly patients and particularly for uh, female patients, that uh, to assess their preoperative bone density and, if possible, if they're impaired, get them on Forteo or some other anabolic agent, which does tend to promote fusion uh, as opposed to bisphosphonates. I think al alignment planning is key, and we do know that uh, failure to appropriately lordose patients in the lumbar spine and conversely uh, to overlordose may uh, both play a role in uh, creating a risk factor for non-union. Um, I'm still a believer in A-lifts at 5.1 and 4.5, particularly if those discs are, uh, are elevated and still healthy or a plump disc. Um, I tend to favor inner bodies at all laminectomized levels and rather than rely on a posterior column fusion. Um, I've been using 6.0 or 6.35 diameter uh, titanium mainly in my practice now for a number of years. And uh, I always use bilateral pelvic fixation and now uh, usually dual fixation depending on the construct. And I am a believer in e-stim. I think that there is a good data to support that. I, I uh, don't use implantable electrical stimulators, but I do like the external, uh, externally applied electrical stimulators. And I think that's actually cost effective when you look at the reduction in the need for revision surgeries. And then uh, I have gone to spanning high-risk regions with, I'm going to say, four rods uh, rather than three. And I'll go through, again, some, some of the history and some of the constructs. So one of the things I think that has really um, been transformative in terms of our toolkit the last several years is the modularity that we've experienced. And what's missing from this slide is a dual head screw, which is yet another uh, example of how uh, we uh, uh, can connect um, multiple rods into a single solid construct. So starting on some case examples, this is, I'll say, Lake Union uh, here in, um, in Seattle. This is, this is the small lake uh, in our city. Lake Washington is the uh, huge lake. Uh, but uh, this is some activity there, the sailboats. That's a regular activity uh, over uh, near downtown Seattle. So here's an example out of my own practice from many years ago, a 34-year-old woman who uh, had um, uh, a mental disability. She was always in my clinic with her her mother and with her sister and had a delightful relationship with them and uh, was incredibly supported uh, and was she was a, a just a a treasured member of her community, I'll say, uh, where she worked as a volunteer in, in various uh, aspects and uh, was just, in my experience, always the most uh, delightful person. You can see what looks like a construct that would translate into a high level of disability, and she would deny that she had any problems. She would come to clinic with looking like this and saying, no, I'm fine, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> And uh, yet you can see she's had a non-union and a dislodgement of the long construct following uh, an anterior thoracic procedure uh, sometime prior and uh, clearly well out of alignment in in both uh, planes. And this was an example of a three rod construct that I did early in my experience with multiple rods. So after laying the first two rods and, and getting our correction, I used a third rod. And I like this concept. This is multiple um, multiple offset connectors, uh, one, to, you know, one set to the left rod and one set to the right rod. And so we're essentially using the third rod as a long cross link and, uh, between the two primary rods. And she ended up with a, a very nice outcome and, and uh, healed all of this. We did a second stage anterior uh, inner body uh, with a, a vertebrectomy uh, at L2 as well as um, the lower level anterior discectomies and fusions. Here's another case early on in my experience. This was a PSO uh, done probably 10 years ago now uh, at, at L4. This gentleman had had, you can see, a potpourri of different implants. Uh, he was not fused at 5.1, was fused at 4.5, and he had an uh, interspinous process spacer at L3.4 with a good deal of kyphosis and uh, degenerative disc disease as well as stenosis and sagittal imbalance. 
so we did a PSO through L4 and a, a two-level, uh, you know, a TLIF at the level of the PSO as well as at the level immediately above, and then a, a revision of the ALIF at five uh, one. And this is an example. I, I now have gone to satellite rods, and one of the case examples will show that uh, these are, I think, you would call them outrigger rods attached to the main construct. Uh, but really, I credit Manish Gupta with uh, really developing the technique of using satellite rods, short segment rods across the three column osteotomy and then bypassing that with longer rods that run top to bottom from the pelvic screws to the upper end of the construct. And I think that has really uh, done the most um, uh, for reducing the rod fracture rate around uh, three column osteotomies. And really, if you think about the biomechanics of that, what that does is it, it takes the primary construct or takes the osteotomy construct off the primary construct and really kind of creates a, a, a nicely protected biomechanical situation that really, it, to me, is the equivalent of a one-level T-lift. And not only is it a one-level T-lift, it is a one-level T-lift protected from external loading as it's not even attached to the primary construct. And then finally, I'll show one case of my current uh, quad rod. Well, no, there is one more case, but this is a, a, a a quad rod construct uh, that's uh, pretty much my standard uh, construct currently. 68-year-old woman with neutral balance but stenosis and axial back pain. And uh, we did a T4 to a pelvis construct with her. And I typically will stop my uh, outrigger rods at about T12, sometimes a little higher for a construct this long. <clears throat> but dual pelvic screws, one set placed by an S2AI approach, a second set placed through something closer to a standard PSIS approach up the wall of the iliac wing, and then several levels of either offset connectors as shown here, or now more currently uh, dual head screws uh, attaching to uh, the outrigger rods. And finally, I'll show an example of cervical thoracic junction. And this was a, a case that I found interesting and operated on this gentleman now over a year ago, too. Uh, he had a very small uh, idiopathic curve in the upper thoracic spine, you can see, and a compensatory curve through the cervical spine. And then he had developed a severe uh, cervical stenosis with myelopathy. Um, and this just shows a little more closer, a little more closely the uh, contour of the cervical spine. So rare to have a, um, a coronal curve in the cervical spine, but this gentleman j definitely did. Uh, this isn't projecting all that well uh, here. Maybe it's better uh, at uh, remote locations, but uh, multi-level cord compression as well. Uh, and we did this. I did this as uh, a staged procedure, uh, but uh, did the posterior part first because I wasn't sure that I could, if I did an anterior approach at the cervical spine, I was, I was not confident that I could uh, get a balanced correction through the thoracic spine. So we did the posterior approach from upper cervical to mid thoracic spine, uh, corrected both, uh, both small curves in the coronal plane, and then came back and did an ALIF, or sorry, an ACDF at several levels in the front of the neck. And this is what that uh, quad rod construct looks like. I don't really have a, a standard construct uh, for a cervical thoracic junction, but I think that it's beneficial in some of these patients. And you can see what we did here was a couple of offset dominoes and then uh, the T1 and T2 pedicle screws placed by a, uh, a further lateral starting point uh, than we used distally, which allowed us to uh, include those in the outrigger rod. And this is what his final construct looks like. And uh, again, not complete correction of the cervical spine uh, deformity, uh, but similarly for the thoracic spine and the end result was a balance of the two curves in the coronal plane. And he's been very happy. So in conclusion, rod fracture does remain a significant concern. I think our implant strategies are changing as we uh, have adopted modularity and potentially uh, new materials. Uh, I've given you some examples out of my own uh, practice, and we'll have a few more to discuss here uh, from both uh, Dr. Chapman and my own uh, cases. Uh, and um, I think we're going to continue to see trends in this direction as we, uh, as we work to improve our outcomes in these complex patients. So stay tuned. New alloys may change the way we approach all of these issues. 
And uh, my last slide, I'm uh, well known to many of you as a Cardinals fan. The photo on the left is my son at the 2011 uh, World Series holding a ball that was flipped to him by Albert Pujols as Albert left the diamond with the third out. Oh, where did that go? So uh, Albert flipped the ball to him, and uh, actually the guy seated right in front of us reached up and grabbed it out of the air. And Albert Pujol stopped on the top level of the dugout and shook his head, pointed at my son, and the man turned around and said, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, maybe I unplugged it. Did I unplug it? Okay. So he, he uh, turned around and said, oh, I'm sorry. I guess this is yours, and handed the ball to my son. It was like something out of the natural, like things were moving in slow motion. The other two photos are just this last summer, and the one on the right shows my son now. He's 20 years old, and he's seated next to my mom and my brother, and we went back for a couple of games last season to watch Albert Pujols' last season, not only as a Cardinal, but as a Major League Baseball player. And at that game, he hit his 695th home run. So shout out to Albert Pujols. He, he gave my son that ball and made sure he got the ball. And he played with wood bats, not titanium, right? <laughs> it was wood bats, yeah. Hey, that was really good. So applause. One question to you, Bob, is, so Dr. Robert Trang, thank you for uh, watching the show, uh, asked the usual question, what's with cobalt chrome? Is it too stiff? Uh, why titanium over cobalt chrome? That's a great question. So I, I use cobalt chrome when it, uh, when it came out uh, in a number of settings. I still will use it occasionally, and I guess the primary clinical application that I've used it for more recently is a, a Scheuermann's disease patient because the titanium a lot of times will bend out as you try to cantilever in to correct a stiff kyphosis. But the issue I've had with cobalt chrome, yes, it's, it's harder to bend, um, but uh, the more pressing thing I found was I was getting late infections around cobalt chrome rods, which I used to see back in the day around stainless, uh, but have really almost never seen around titanium. And, and I think, again, calling out Manish Gupta has done some basic science looking at bacteriostatic properties, and titanium really is better than either stainless or cobalt chrome. Hey, Sig Bervin, are you live? Can you speak? Do my best to speak. Hey, that was that was terrific, uh, Rob. And really, some great points that you brought up. And I, I look forward to evolution new materials. Tell me, my question is going to be about. Uh, although Jens might have another question, but my, my mine's about the role of uh, anterior inner body work, and specifically, you know, in your cervical thoracic cage uh, or case with four rods, your lumbar sacral case um, with, with anterior inner body work. Do you think we have as much of a need for four rods? Well, that's a good question. I, I am a big proponent of anterior inner body, and um, uh, I, it obviously increases fusion rate. Um, I haven't been confident enough, even with a lifts, to go away from the, the four rods constructs I was showing. Um, I, I have adopted, and I've talked about this, I have another talk about it, uh, a, a paradigm whereby I, I do the big posterior operation, get the correction. You know, I think we no longer really have to rely on, ant on anterior releases to get correction uh, in the back and then um, do inner bodies uh, at multiple levels from the back, uh, depending on, again, how flat they are and how uh, stenotic they are. Uh, but then I love the paradigm of locking that down, getting them through the big operation, coming back at four to six weeks later to do a delayed A-lift. And in that case, you're not relying on the A-lift for any sort of correction. Correction. It's strictly about fusion and anterior column support. And um, by that time, what I like about it is the patient has, you know, largely recovered the physiologic impact. They're not anemic. They're not, um, you know, uh, malnourished. They haven't been laying in dirty sheets in their uh, bed. Uh, so uh, when we do an A-lift first, I think we all feel compelled to get them stabilized from the back within a few days. But if you do the posterior part, they're stable, and then you can come back and plug in those grafts. And, and it really doesn't get in their way much in terms of their recovery. So I'm a proponent, um, I, 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 and, and I agree with your, your viewpoint. It definitely increases fusion rate. Um, but I'm, I'm still not confident enough to, to rely on that without uh, strong posterior fixation. Bob, it's Jack Ziegler. Um, thank you very much. And I, I don't want to take a lot of uh, time for the, from the fellows. Quick question about Forte use. 
Can you just uh, give us an idea how long you treat preoperatively? And then if you do it post-op as well, and how long? Yes. So uh, I, I will try to get Forteo, even if they're not, frankly, osteoporotic, but osteopenic, if I'm planning a big construct. Variably uh, successful at getting insurance authorization, and it's essentially impossible for patients to afford typically uh, without insurance authorization. I, I like to do six weeks, or sorry, six months post pre-op, and then I think there's a you know there's a label limit of not greater than two years. But I think going ahead and finishing out the two years, uh, so a, a year and a half post-op uh, has been my standard practice. I, I don't have, I don't think there's any data or guidelines to go off of, but that's just my practice. And we'll discuss some things on Dr. Hicks's uh, cases, uh, failure of mine. But <clears throat> for our uh, faculty, uh, SIG, obviously Dr. Hart and uh, Jack, uh, Dr. Oskurian says, are PJK and PJF rates really just getting higher and higher because our constructs are getting stiffer? Are we more doing more surgeries and less optimized patients? What's going on? Are our constructs too stiff? Is that a role? Well, it's a great concern. Um, I think there there is some data, that, and it's just coming out now, and there's an ISSG paper that's been accepted uh, that uh, suggests that multi-rod constructs don't have any higher rate of PJF. And I think the reason is because the, the, the outrigger rods or the satellite rods are contained well below the proximal junction. So the end effect on the proximal junction uh, remains uh, limited. Um, and that's that would be my guess as to why, but um, I think it's a real concern for sure, and one that we're going to need to be monitoring and, and aware of. You agree with that, Zig? You're, you're muted. You're muted. Zig, unmute. Yeah, we're yourself. not hearing you. Yes, I, I do agree with that. I think you know, in general, the multi rods aren't going all the way to the top, so it's a bit of a transition. When I'm using multi-rods, I'm much more likely to use titanium than if I'm just using two rods. Um, I think that the rate of PJK that we're seeing has a lot to do with going to the sacrum. And I think the uh, prevalence of going to the sacrum is really what's what's driving a lot of that rate. I know that uh, earlier on in my career, certainly when I was training, it was not uncommon that we'd stop at L4 or L5, and I'm rarely doing that now. And I, I think that that's really the, the biggest uh, risk factor. Great point. Yeah, yeah it definitely is. Should we go to cases? Dr. Hicks, I'm you ready. ready? Yes. All uh, right. Can you hear me okay? Dr. We Hicks can. is originally from the University of Alabama, and he is most likely going to return to his home state, so a southern comfort, and he has a case of mine. Okay, very good. Let me uh, share the screen here. So roll tide, Jimmy. <laughs> Roll tie. Roll tie, as we say. For Dr. Hicks' um, standards, I want to point out to the audience, this is a pretty small font. <clears throat> there we are. Dive into some uh, interesting cases here. Okay, so, um, 72-year-old history of T9 to pelvis fixation for deformity several years ago. Thank you. Uh, she feels that her back broke while helping her husband, uh, disabled husband, up and around the house. Um, she developed subsequent severe low back pain and forward lean. She does have an associated L5 radiculopathy. Next slide here. So we can see AP lateral here. Um, she does have a previous peak in her body at L5S1. There are broken rods near the bottom cross connector. And we have concern for non-union uh, whenever we do see these uh, broken rods and um, her uh, symptoms. That's the overall uh, sagittal profile scoli film. And uh, again, concerning on CT would be the non-union at that lumbosacral junction. Uh, a rather erosive property to the uh, L5-S1 uh, segment there. And as you can see on either side left and right, uh, the broken rods uh, where that cross connector is. And so prior to moving on, I don't know if there's any, any discussion about uh, what you all prefer to do next. So maybe I'll ask Sig, so what should we do uh, as a workup when we have a patient where there's a hardware failure? This happened again seven 
Jimmy, correct me if I'm wrong, seven years after her index surgery that I performed. Correct, several years. <clears throat> and she was just kept bending, straightening. I clearly have a non-union there uh, in that peak cage at the bottom. It's kind of intersuscepted. I think I used off-label BMP at the time. I'm not sure. Um, but how should we work that patient up? Should we get a CT myelogram, TC9 bone scan, SED rate? Kind of talk us through what we should kind of do as a basic and more an expanded workup. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, late fractures are something that we're recognizing more, and certainly we ought to be suspicious for possibly a late infection. I think that'd be unlikely, but uh, a non-union with uh, finally the hardware or the implants broke. What, what was the inner body at 5-1? Was that an A-lift or was that a, a posterior-based inner body? No, that, that was all done posteriorly. Yeah. And, um, again, that's what I mentioned earlier. I do, I do think that the, that the anterior inner body support is, is a bit more reliable in the long run there. Um, in terms of further workup, I would definitely get some basic labs, make sure this isn't a late infection. So set rate, CRP, CBC with a differential. And the concern I, I think I heard you say was that there's a new uh, L5 radiculopathy, and uh, certainly right. that may be related to some subsidence. So, you know, Rob pointed out that uh, there, there's the incidence of broken rods, and there are some cases that are asymptomatic and some that are symptomatic. So this is a unilateral broken rod, with, or I couldn't tell if it's unilateral or bilateral. It's in the area of the crosslink. I think that's a risk factor to some extent. Uh, the, 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 that's something Keith Bridwell had shown that non-unions are more likely in the area of the cross-link. And, and this is a case where I, I probably, once I rule out infection, I probably wouldn't get a myelogram. I think I, I would just plan, plan to decompress that well, starting off from the back. And the question becomes, do you need to reconstruct the anterior column? And um, I, I think at 5-1 in a patient who hasn't had prior anterior surgery with that much osteolysis, I think I probably would uh, do what Bob suggested is start off in the back, stabilize this, uh, possibly get four rods across there. And I probably would actually do the anterior on this just because there's such an impressive gap there at 5-1. All right. In the interest of time, Jimmy, take us along. Yeah. So we have um, uh, progression to postoperative films here. Uh, so we, we did go uh, back in posteriorly. Um, uh, essentially, uh, inline connectors you know, revising from uh, essentially the mid middle construct on downward. Um, it is a uh, quad rod construct, and we have um, uh, closer rods to the uh, re osteotomized uh, segment and bilateral um, expandable cages. And we also have rods uh, bridging across uh, that segment in the pelvis. So I had a complication on her. She had a dural tear on the area of the S1 root shoulder, which was basically crisscrossing that non side. So it's more than S1 radiculopathy. Clinically, it was an L5. And um, uh, I, she did have a hygroma, actually. We treated non-surgery. She also had a weaker L5 dorsiflexion, despite a pretty atraumatic exchange, removal of the old cage and exchange. I hear loud and clear on the ALIF, uh, and I, I'm thinking of, of that all the time, but I, I did do this posterior reconstruction. She was actually clinically very happy with the almost immediate resolution of her back pain, but I do need to acknowledge those two complications. Any thoughts or comments, Jack or uh, Bob or Sig? I think it looks great. I think, you know, this is an example of, uh, you know, the uh, satellite rods. And this is very similar to a PSO. It's uh, slightly different, but I think the mechanics of what you've created here are very similar to what we hope to create with a satellite rod across a PSO. And this essentially is a form of a three-column osteotomy, I think, uh, uh, that you've really developed. And, and um, uh, I've seen the successes you've had. And this is uh, yet another example. So uh, Tina, by the way, asked us uh, myelopathy. Is that, what is myelopathy? It's a spinal cord disease. And what areas does it affect? It affects the cervical, the thoracic spine, and the junction of the thoracic spine to the lumbar spine called conus. It by itself does not affect the lumbar spine. That would not be considered myelopathy, but I appreciate the question. Jimmy had another case, and I think one of um, Dr. Hart's. Yes. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so uh, we'll jump straight into uh, one of Dr. Hart's cases here. So 71-year-old uh, with Parkinson's disease and prior to 4B surgery. Um, 
some could argue with uh, poor correction presents uh, through the emergency department to our uh, service. Uh, they did have uh, myelopathic symptoms and postural issues uh, sitting and standing. Um, in particular, the myelopathic symptoms, uh, not necessarily affecting the arms as much as uh, the trunk and uh, the uh, legs with gait instability. Um, so this is the uh, patient on arrival. Um, and as you can see, there is some decompensation at the upper portion uh, of this uh, construct here. Um, again, one can argue uh, the a uh, varied amount of uh, correction that was attained in the original procedures. Um, and this is just a close-up of the, uh, essentially the segmental change that we can see in the uh, cervical thoracic junction as well as in the cervical spine. And I think with the um, possibly some associated myopathy and also degenerative change anteriorly we have uh, in the neck leads to uh, several degrees of, of change in each segment uh, leading to the uh, deformity that we have um, here. And uh, this is the MRI uh, at that time. Um, there was indeed uh, compression high up in the cervical spine, but mostly uh, concerning and uh, certainly symptomatic was the lower portion uh, in the adjacent segment uh, to the construct. And prior to uh, moving on, I just want to see if there are any, any further comments. I'm going to just add, I think you, you used appropriately two different terms relevant to the earlier question is uh, the myelopathy is uh, certainly the neural compression, but also the probable myopathy uh, and the fact that its extensor muscles probably are not functioning normally. And so, so both of those I think you, you used appropriately, and I think both of those are considerations for why this is uh, becoming a progressive kyphosis or junctional kyphosis. Mm -hmm. I'll add a couple of quick comments. So one is that uh, these x-rays don't really do justice to the extent of what was not quite fully chin on chest deformity, but uh, she was very uh, posturally affected by the cervical thoracic kyphosis. And the second is that you can see she's had a deep brain stimulator placed. That was done by our partner here, Pete Nora. Uh, and I touched base with Dr. Nora on this. The, the diagnostic dilemma was, is this a progression of her Parkinsonism, or is it uh, is it myelopathy? And and the consensus uh, in conversation with her other caregivers was that this was indeed a progression of her myelopathy. And both very very good points. Um, and moving on, uh, we have uh, the development of um, what was done here. A very nice construct, and actually um, quad rod construct using a. Uh, cervical thoracic spine, uh, very nicely done, and uh, also uh, a supporting uh, ACDF, uh, I believe done at 7-1 uh, to help get some correction there. And there were uh, posterior osteotomies also involved uh, with this case as well. Hey, Sig. So first of all, Bob, this looks spectacular. I must say that I have not used quad rods in the cervical thoracic junction, but seeing this, I may have to change my mind. Uh, Sig, so dual core versus uh, small caliber rods, cervical thoracic junction, deformity corrections. Address kind of the mechanical aspects of that from your view. Yeah, I think it's uh, the, the, the dual core certainly gives us the strength to cross our osteotomies and uh, it, it looks like, Bob, you, this might have been a posterior first, then anterior again, but uh, you've got some anterior column support, but perhaps most of the correction uh, from osteotomies that were probably at uh, you know, 7 one one two two three because it was a junctional kyphosis. So the, the thing that I'll just comment on briefly is, is the connectors. Is, um, you know, in general, if we're going to do osteotomies across the upper thoracic spine, I'll probably go down to more the mid-thoracic spine with my connectors to uh, allow some closure across that upper thoracic spine. But having said that, I think you, you've done a terrific uh, reconstruction here. I, I do prefer the transitional rods, and, and specifically I'll have a 5.5 five rod that'll typically run up to my C7 pedicle screw. Uh, so you know, making sure you call that out uh, before you put the screw in, because I've certainly seen situations where I forgot to put a 3.5 head intending to have a 5.5, five, but I'll tend to have my 5.5 five rod run across my osteotomies and then transition to the 3.5 rod above C6. 
Very, very good. Hey, uh, so we got a question from the audience, and we can't take all the questions from our patients. We have a large YouTube live viewership, but I thought this is an interesting question. I'll direct it to Jack first. There's a Kathy on YouTube, and she's had Harrington rods since 1975, fused from T4 down. Question A, will they break? They haven't broken that she knows of. Should she worry about that? And B, is neck pain common after Harrington long fusions? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I would agree with you in giving her advice that if they haven't broken in all these years, there's probably solid fusion around them. Um, and then the second part is it kind of depends on how high they are, what her overall T4, is T4. Uh, uh, above it. Um, and whether, you know, she's she's fallen into some cervical thoracic or upper thoracic kyphosis and then she's hyperextending her neck to compensate. So she may have some uh, degenerative changes that are responsible for uh, neck pain. Yeah. Now we thank our um, uh, patient audience also for tuning in. All right, uh, next case. Should we go for another one? Sure. But that's beautifully done, I must I'll, say. I'll, I'll just say just briefly. So Sig was right on. This was all done posteriorly first. I wouldn't have done 7-1, but she actually ruptured her ALL with a correction there. And so I felt I wanted anterior column support. So that's what we did there. And the funniest thing is, uh, ironically, she was in my clinic today for her one-year follow-up. Uh, she's doing very nicely, but she has had persistent swallowing uh, difficulties, which date to around the time of this surgery, and maybe due to uh, stretching of the esophagus, uh, not positive, but uh, uh, it's either that or a progression of her Parkinson's disease, and we had that conversation. But the overall alignment, last thing I'll say is the overall alignment, of course, makes me a little you know, looking at it, I'm a little uh, wincing, but um, we had long conversations about whether to try to change that, and that was clearly not the priority at the time that she came through uh, our, uh, our ED. One more quick question before Dr. Seidel gets live. On this patient with neuromuscular deformity, is it reasonable to do a cervical laminoplasty? As everybody knows, I'm a fan of those procedures. But Sig, maybe you take a first lead. Is it reasonable to do a laminoplasty as we have preserved lordosis in this patient who wants to just droop forwards? You know, I, I also agree. Where, where there's equipoise, the laminoplasty could be a great option. In this case, I really thought the patient was both kyphotic and, and the presenter pointed out perhaps related to myopathy. If somebody's got a myopathy, I, I really lean towards, especially a Parkinsonian patient, I, I lean towards a definitive fusion as, as was done here. I'd be reluctant to do a, uh, a laminoplasty in somebody who had a, a myopathy and deficiency to posterior extensor muscles. Yeah, so important, uh, Sig pointed out, Dr. Bervin pointed out before, myopathy, M-Y-O versus myelopathy, M-Y-E-L-O. That one is core disease, that's a lot of one. The other one is muscle disease. So this is muscle disease and core disease together. All right, Chris, next. All right. So the case I'm presenting is a 78-year-old man. He came in complaining of low back pain, occasional left lower extremity pain, bilateral dorsal foot numbness. He is status post laminectomies with lateral recess decompressions from L2 to L5 uh, with posterior lateral effusion of T10 of the pelvis. Uh, prior A-list from 3 to S1 back in 10 years ago. Uh, medical history, not super significant. Some cardiac history, mitral regurge, uh, history of prostate cancer. Um, he previously worked in finance, but now he was participating in uh, malaria research and was doing that in Africa. So on presentation, uh, he's got decreased sensation in the left L5 distribution, tenderness to palpation over the lumbosacral junction. He's got a positive straight leg raise. It's worse on the right than the left. He's unable to stand, however, and has some prominent hardware at the lumbosacral junction. He's got also claw toes on the right foot and gluteal atrophy bilaterally. Um, weakness with hip abduction, dorsiflexion, EHL. So here are um, some initial films. You can see he's got a uh, what looks like a non-union uh, and hardware failure as the rods are out of the S2AI screws. There's a grade two anterior lithesis of L5 on S1. And on the standing lateral, you can see he's got a mismatch of about 30 degrees with a positive SVA of about 10. Um, here's CT just highlighting 
exactly what I just said. So you can see the non-union there down at the bottom of the lumbar sacral junction. Um, I tried to find the old op note. Uh, he doesn't list what he used as an inner body there. Obviously, it's not titanium, um, but I wasn't able to figure out exactly what was used. This is stainless steel. This is done by a surgeon who I know well, it was. and he uses stainless steel. Okay. Yeah. And this was an anterior procedure. Yep, all and of those add to that. He had a large anterior fusion done over three or four levels. Yep, from L3 to S1. And he had a terrible time with it. This is a very indolent man, very sophisticated guy. Yeah. But he basically had one worry. He did not want this revised because he's thought that everybody would want to go to the front. He's thought several opinions. Jack, you go in from the front again, right? So this guy had basically a shark bite anterior exposure for a four level or three level uh, ALIF. Do you go in from the front again with uh, some thought and consideration? I know you guys are amazing with your anterior procedures, but this guy had a heck of a time. I don't know what all happened, but uh, what do you do in that kind of a setting? I would try to avoid it, Gans. I, you know, we're pretty circumspect about uh, wading back into uh, the anterior spine. Um, you know, at L5S1, uh, you know, we might be a little bit uh, uh, more aggressive. Um, but in general, we try to find any option uh, not to have to do that unless your your hand is forced by vascular issues, uh, you know, infection that you can't control medically, or um, you know, some other horrendous uh, reason. But otherwise, we really tr would try to avoid that. Yeah. And so the, the, morbid the morbidity potential risks are so high. So, Sig, this is a pretty large defect in the front. Any thoughts of how to fill this in? Uh, I mean, this guy is very intelligent, very sophisticated. He did not want another surgery. He actually went around a number of surgeons who said, we need to try to go in from the front. I know it was bad. We'll do a ureteral stents, yada, yada, yada. But he said, I'm not doing that. So how do you fill in this gap? Yeah, this is one. It's a great example of the difference between a standing x-ray and a uh, the opportunistic CT you have here. So you had mentioned that the lumbar pelvic mismatch was about 30 degrees, but, but I would suggest that maybe we ought to measure that mismatch on this supine film, because truly this is what we've got uh, when we're on the table. Um, so to say 30 degrees, I'm automatically thinking of doing a three column osteotomy, whereas in this case, uh, we, we probably don't uh, if we get them in this position on a table. So. And again, I'm thinking certainly this is going to be four rods across the lumbar pelvic junction. To me, uh, that's going to be a, a S2AI uh, with an iliac screw is typically how, how I uh, do my four rods, although more recently I've been doing more of a, an S1AI, so having two points of fixation on each side across the SI joint. So I'm going to have four rods across here from the back. I'm going to get the correction from the back, and then the question becomes, what do I need to do in the front? And I'll tell you, a little bit like Jack, is I've got a low threshold to go back in the front, but if it's truly something that's not going to happen uh, uh, by patient preference, then I'd, I'd probably uh, fill this from the back, again, having four rods in the back, and I, I'd probably, first of all, I think that's probably a femoral ring in the front there at five one. Isn't it a femoral ring with a, with a, with a screw? They they had I think done peak spacers. The I, I think it's spacers. peak, but I don't have yeah, I mean, absolutely a thumb ring. But but whatever it is, uh, you know you certainly can fill the space from the back. Uh, you showed us in the first case, Jens, the, the hazards of that right is possibly a non-union or possibly of a, of a dural tear. Uh, I'd strongly prefer to go in the front. But if I if my hands were tied, I would uh, uh, do this from the back with an inner body, uh, probably an expandable inner body in my hands. And um, in, in some cases, I can get a transosseous screw like a Bowman, but there's just not enough. It's, it's too steep here. I, I can't do either fibula, fibula or transosseous screw here. So I, I'd probably fill it from the back with an expandable cage. All right, Chris, sure. resolve, resolve the case. What do we do? Uh, so what we decided to do was uh, revision surgery, obviously, from L2 to the pelvis, re-decompress him, partial corpectomy at S1 and L5 with removal of that previous inner body spacer, obviously, uh, then placement of bilateral expandable cages and an SI orthodesis there. So here are post-op CT images. You can see we have bilateral expandable cages down there. Those are some big cages there, yeah. and so those cages went in at uh, at 16 millimeters probably, didn't they? Yeah, no, we put them in horizontal and then turn them in the yeah. patient. So these are cervical yeah. cages with variable footprints. 
right. and we then jack them up and then expand them together. So. Alan Daniels, uh, Dr. Hart's uh, former fellow, wrote uh, several cases. I've done, I don't know how many, seven, eight of those now, where I just did not want or could not do a corpectomy. And I've done dual expandable cervical cages. I'm sure administrators are not happy with the cost, but I've actually been quite happy with the mechanics and the yeah. healing. And some of them are pretty desperate situations. So We actually were able to increase his lumbar lordosis quite a bit and uh, got his mismatch down to about, I think, 15-ish. Yeah. And he actually did quite well, right? I mean, yeah. So he's five months post-op at this point. Pain is much better. Quality of life is much better. Um, and he's happy overall. These are the most recent post-op films we have. I think he went on a cruise shortly afterwards. <laughs> that sounds like him. Yeah. Bob, what do you think? Should we have Abe present that case? It's one of my favorite cases, and you did that uh, that correction of the oif. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I'm happy to move on, but I, I would call out this is a, a great result and a nice approach uh, again. You know, one further point that I think we can draw from these two cases you showed were is, uh, is the need for long-term follow-up in these patients. And I typically will see them at least through two years and then tell them they can come every year or uh, certainly by five years. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, avoiding this kind of bone resorption uh, by intervening early, which, you know, the, the patient may not be perceiving uh, that they're having a clinical problem until it becomes really a, a kind of a, a, an enormous clinical problem. Yeah, we, we did the breed and we used um, uh, our thoracoscopy irrigators, mm -hmm. nine liters. We had intraoperative cultures. We had intraoperative pathology come by to make sure there was nothing mm -hmm. dubious in there. And we had a complete through and through washout left and right. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And sure. Dr. Schlaudraff, are you live? Yep. He is, it, this is one of my favorite cases and I was not involved in it. It's a Dr. Hart case, but uh, show us what you got. Yeah, so this is uh, going to take us home, I think. I'll be cautious of time. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. Great. Uh, so this is a 70-year-old uh, female who presented a clinic uh, originally with axial low back pain, mid thoracic pain, also pretty severe right uh, lower extremity pain. Uh, she had symptomatic thoracic hyposis and inability to ambulate. Uh, she had multiple prior surgeries, total of four. Originally, she had a, a T12 to S1 posterior fusion done back to 2014 at Cedar Sinai. And then she developed back pain, secondary to PJK and leucine. Uh, so, actually, had her hardware removed uh, in February prior to presentation about a year ago now at Outside Hospital down in Oregon. And then ultimately, she ended up going to going a, a surgery with us, which I'll go into later. Overall, neurologically, she was intact, uh, full strength, normal sensation. Uh, normal reflexes. Labs were uh, not contributory. Here's uh, preoperative uh, standing scully films. Uh, you can see there that she has uh, quite a bit of a, a bad thoracolumbar deformity with uh, lumbar kyphosis above her uh, previous uh, fusion construct, and she also has quite a bit of a leftward leaning gait. Here's a preoperative uh, CT myelogram of sagittal views. Showing there that she does have uh, a pseudos at 4551, a previous A lift there, and then she had uh, three levels of X lifts with uh, P cages uh, above that. And then above her uh, L2, she had a, a compression for me there. Also had a poor bone quality as well, on top of everything else that's going on. All right, speed speed round here. <laughs> Sig, there's just a, one or more problems here. Just flash back one slide there, Abe. Uh, I, I thought it was a, a prior L2 PSO, but um, maybe, maybe that wasn't the case because at this point, I think I do a three column osteotomy extended PSO grade four at the apex at L2, put four rods across uh, the five one and um, um, take this up to uh, probably probably at least T10. Yeah, so no previous P uh, PSO. They just did uh, a lift and three levels of laterals and fused her uh, from 12 to S1. So that's yeah, more. And, and was, right. was there prior infection then? That was the hardware was taken out? No, mainly. So it sounds like she had loosening of hardware and PJK. So they end up just taking out all of her hardware. So no infection. 
Yeah, so just quickly, I, I do an extended PSO at two. I'd extend it up to a neutral stable vertebra, which it looks like that'd be at, at least T10. Uh, I wouldn't go up to T4 uh, on this unless uh, uh, unless that, that neutral stable vertebra was above T10. All right, apes, drum roll. So we did, uh, like you said, we did a, a grade four a PSO at L2. Uh, used an allograft cage there ventrally and pivoted around it. Uh, then actually used six rods. So there was a satellite rod that was across the PSO site, and then there's a primary working rod and then an outrigger rod uh, going thoraco lumbar and went up to the uh, UIV of uh, T4. Well, that, that's terrific. I, uh, I agree with uh, this beautiful post operative alignment and. And doing the A lift at five one um, um, to, to to revise that. Just one, one question: What were your thoughts, uh, Rob, about having four rods across five one? So you sort of, I, 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 I guess you do there. You've got four rods across five one, uh, but not four points of pelvic fixation. <clears throat> yeah, I'm kind of regretting that. As I look at that, I'm thinking uh, she probably could have done with another pair of pelvic screws. But this is a domino connector placed between the S1 pedicle screw and the S2AI pelvic screw. Looks terrific in the end. Yeah, no, six rods. I've not matched that, so you, you got ahead of me. But <clears throat> Jack, take us out of here. So uh, first of all, many thanks to Bob and our fellows for jumping into the breach and uh, putting this talk and uh, this series together. Hopefully it was interesting. We really enjoyed the audience mentions and uh, Sig as always, it's a treat to have you and your wisdom there. Jack, give us the words of wisdom. There's a lot of metal in this, but um, give us a big picture yeah. perspective. Um, not, yeah, I'd do the same thing you did. Um, Jens, I would have phoned a friend. I would have called, uh, called Sig. And I think Randy Davis left the comment that this is uh, sort of not the thing that the average spine surgeon is going to tackle. And uh, thank God there are guys like uh, you and Bob and, and Sig and Izzy around to, uh, to do these. So thank you for passing on the knowledge. Uh, so I appreciate it and wishing everybody well. And Bob, good luck with, uh, with your personal situation. Thank you for being here. And thank you all for joining us. And Dr. Huang, thank you for the dis <coughs> discussion. Tomorrow night, we have the WSOA meeting, by the way. So you're all welcome. We have cool talks on entrepreneurship, how to guide patients towards weight loss and uh, stress fractures. So 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific uh, Daylight Time, if you want to log in. Thank you all.